eerste spreker van vandaag is Gabi Amit. Hij is uh, de founder en principal van New Deal Design. Maar jullie kennen zijn naam waarschijnlijk ook wel als een van de uh, uitvinders van de Fitbit. Um, hij heeft ook gewerkt aan de Palm Zire. Dat was begin 2000 een van de snelst verkopende uh, personal assistants. En hij gaat spreken over wearables. En dat is een hot topic. En dan ga ik ook overschakelen naar het Engels, want hij is Engels, uh, hij spreekt Engels. En uh, dat um, is wel netjes, if he knows how I introduced the man. Um, so it's a hot topic, wearables among you. Uh, what can we do with it? What can we offer our clients? Is it something we should do? What are the limitations? What are the possibilities? Um, so here, please give a warm welcome to Gabi Amit. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'll talk about um, well, uh, health and digital uh, gadgets and wearables and so on. Uh, but first I want to introduce uh, what we do in the studio. We have about 35 uh, creative people in the San Francisco studio. And we've been doing all the Fitbit uh, devices basically since creation. Um, more or less Fitbit uh, started in our little office. Uh, we also done uh, things like the Lytra camera a few years ago, and we also work with uh, rather large companies. This is one of the latest uh, projects uh, that we've done. This is uh, Project Aura by uh, Google, which just happened to be kind of an historic day yesterday on the stage of Google I.O. Um, the phone nearly booted up, nearly. <laughs> 95% there, uh, but it's becoming a reality, and hopefully early uh, 2015 we'll have real ones and uh, we could play with them. So, um, among other things, we won the National Design Award uh, last year, and the most important thing for me uh, in approaching technology is to bring a different philosophy to the table. Uh, a lot of our clients are coming from uh, science or technology, uh, programmers, and so on and so forth, and they are really good in analytical and rational thinking. Um, the problem we always face is to balance that with the more emotional qualities. And for me, inside the studio, this is a, a daily uh, struggle to make sure that we bring the right uh, equation to the table, that uh, products and experiences that we create are not uh, just utilitarian. They have something else. And the most important thing is for me, um, having a, a common person um, sensibility and uh, sensitivities being represented through the work we do. So a big thing for us at New Deal is the balance between IQ and EQ. And that is going to be very relevant uh, with wearables. And the rest of my presentation is going to kind of do a deep dive into wearables and explain where we are and what, uh, what is coming ahead of us. Um, what's happening today is kind of a revolution, but also an evolution of things that happened and percolated for the last 20, 30 years uh, related to personal health. Uh, in the good old days, uh, health was managed by our doctors, and we all uh, got more or less bored out of it and also got more educated about what we're supposed to be doing with our body outside the doctor's office. So nowadays, just about everyone is taking care of their health in a much more involved and a much more uh, responsible way. And what's happening is that technology is starting to help us doing that, And this is a phenomenon that is now coming back to change how the medical profession is actually dealing with us, the regular uh, Joes around. And that is essentially happening now. This is, these are the years where uh, we get to influence back on the medical system with gadgets uh, like um, never before. So I'll start with uh, two Quick examples, uh, but before that, maybe let me jump through some uh, stats. Um, the U.S. has a mo monster problem with uh, healthcare costs, 
And uh, at the same time, uh, the people in the U.S. are medicated like never before. And that's uh, also contributing to uh, the cost issues, but also it's a, it's a state of dependency. It's a state of, um, I would say, somewhat an anxiety across the whole society. Uh, the interesting thing that part of the rejection or part of the... Um, uh, denial is uh, non-adherence or non-compliance with uh, prescriptions and non-compliance with doctors' uh, procedures and so on. And the striking number here is that the cost of uh, non-compliance is in an order of something like between two and three hundred billion dollars a year. Uh, mistakes and actually sometimes even fatal mistakes out of um, um, non-compliance. Um, this is where the stuff I'm dealing daily with, you know, hardware, software, cloud, is uh, very effective in, in, in solving. And the important thing for me is that uh, without any skepticism, digital technology can, can make a difference, a uh, significant difference. Uh, we know, for instance, that people, uh, just in this field of uh, activity trackers, people who track uh, their behaviors are about 46%, um, um, about 46 of them will actually change their behavior and start uh, walking more. Uh, we know, for instance, with Fitbit, which is a company that I um, work with a lot, that uh, over 40% actually increase their daily activity just by looking at these devices and seeing that you've been a couch potato for most of the day. So it's about time to take your dog around the neighborhood. And um, that's something that is sustainable, although sometimes people let go and drop their Fitbits or activity trackers after a few months. But they still keep on uh, walking around, and um, as a result, people lose weight. Lose weight without diet, without prescriptions. They just lose weight because they become more active. With that said, um, let's see some videos. So if Fitbit was something that deals with relatively innocuous activity, walking, the next device is dealing with something quite more acute. Uh, we're dealing now with a device that was introduced last year to Germany um, by a company called Insulin, and it deals with uh, insulin um, taking by um, diabetics. And what this device is doing is basically cutting the amount of insulin uh, these uh, guys are uh, taking every day and also dispersing that insulin a lot faster into the bloodstream. As a result of that, these uh, diabetics feel a lot more free to go and do their uh, daily routines, and it has an amazing impact uh, psychologically and socially about their, on their life.
So these are just teeny examples of what could uh, happen in the next few years. And the most important technological uh, change has been the advent of sensor and sensory technology. We have now sensors for just about anything. We have things that are essentially a lab on a chip that actually could take a blood sample and actually detect certain minute components there and give you a very personalized uh, uh, test very much within your palm, essentially a device that is that small. Uh, we have uh, sensors that deal with exposure to chemicals, exposure to sun, exposure to a variety of other uh, conditions. We have a lot of sports medicine. We have uh, sensors that are uh, geared towards dogs and pets, and I'll show you some of it later. And we have things that deal with hydration, uh, growth, and so on. And the most amazing thing is that with latest uh, brain uh, research, we're getting to a point that now we have sensors that can detect whether you are in the right mood and the right mind activity that allows you to do the right uh, creative work, for instance. So we're getting to a point that sensors are um, so sophisticated, and the question is what to do with them. And this is where design comes to play. If so far, design, industrial design, I, I was trained as an industrial designer 25 years ago. Typically, industrial designers didn't deal with things that actually touched the human body, and let alone were becoming part of your body, essentially. Nowadays, this is what we do, and design is becoming, uh, in my opinion, the critical differentiator between the success or failure of these wearables and these technologies that apply to uh, our personal health. Uh, I'll give you some examples. Uh, within our studio, we got 35 people. Uh, this is a, there's a very famous uh, or very important uh, dimension, which is the circumference of a wrist. Uh, we have uh, differences of 100% within our uh, group. Uh, just random number, 35 people. The smallest risk to the largest risk, uh, 2x, essentially. The largest risk is twice. And here you see dad carrying uh, his son, and they probably have a 10x size differences. So how do you deal with that? It's a physical, serious problem, especially since many of these sensors need to be placed accurately on a specific organ or a specific feature of the body. Uh, People usually talk about fashion in terms of wearables. Oh, it needs to be fashionable. But the problem with fashion is not necessarily the styling. The problem with fashion is it's changing all the time. People change their outfit sometimes two, three times through the day. and We don't even pay attention. We go to the gym, we, pay, we, we, we switch. We go to a dinner party, we switch. And so on and so forth. Now, just as a, an example, just focus on the shoes. We have in this picture about four or five different configurations of shoes. We got sneakers and we got high heels, we got boots, short boots, and so on. We got such a variety in fashion that we need to accommodate all these uh, different configurations and all these styles. And the interesting thing is, once you decided that this is a certain size that you want, you'll find out that people do whatever they want. They will opt to uh, hold or to attach the device any way they feel good about. The problem is that when you're putting sensor on a skin and somebody decides to you know, let loose, so to speak, the problem is that the sensor won't work. So these are the, 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 the issues we're dealing uh, uh, on a daily basis. One of the most difficult topics for me to explain is that people have a very strong sell, uh, sense of self. It's not only that the device will work. It's not only that they will look good at that. It's that moment where they look at the mirror and they see themselves with the device and they approve. So it doesn't matter if they're loved ones or the significant other say, so, you know, you look great, honey. It doesn't matter. You need to look to feel good with yourself with this device. Now, 
Part of that is an issue of gender identity, and the way we manifest gender identity is through accessorizing. And that is a very touchy topic. And there are major cultural barriers to touch on that. Now, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, this is a device that is uh, uh, going to be uh, released very soon. It's a, by a company called Sproutling. And it's um, a very sophisticated baby monitor. It gives you a lot of indications about the baby and the nursery around the baby. And it's shaped like a little uh, heart. And it's done so, so it fits nicely on this chunky, cute ankle. Uh, we have um, uh, a Fitbit for dogs, for lack of better terms. It's called Whistle. And it's been a huge success. It actually has a second version coming with a GPS. And over here, with pets, we have an interesting uh, play. We have three different uh, parties to, the, to, to, to this device. There's the dog, there's the dog owner, and she wants to know what the dog has gone through the whole day, and there is the vet. So the interesting thing with Whistle is that for the first time, we actually can, can take data and send it back to the vet. We cannot do that with uh, humans yet because there are regulations about privacy and how do you handle uh, medical records. With dogs, it's different. Now, so far, kind of did a quick overview of where we are, and also I want to start dealing with the problems. As people play with these technologies and start um, building products, it's inevitable that some mistakes will happen. And it's inevitable that through this experimentation, we will find the right way. But we are now in the beginning, essentially. So we have some issues that are not resolved, and I want to go through them. One of the biggest problems we have currently is this um, appetite for data, and appetite for looking at your phone. And I noticed that, even though I don't speak any Dutch. I noticed that Jasper asked you not to look at your phone. And I'm sure you find it quite challenging. And the reason is that we got pre-programmed nowadays to look at the phone every few seconds. So part of the solution was supposedly uh, a monitor stuck right above your eye. And it's a difficult topic from a social perspective. It's also some kind of creating essentially a, a cyborg society, society that is driven by a lot of data and, and, and feedbacks. And supposedly, you need to ask yourself every few seconds, where am I and what I'm supposed to do? It's a very demanding and actually quite stressful uh, situation. Which brings me to the other story, which if we're dealing with a term called quantified self, we know now that one of the biggest problems we have with these types of Fitbits and trackers is that people let go. After a few months, they stop. They change their behavior, and they moved on. They don't want to get more uh, data feeds. They basically want to check out. And the whole notion of quantify self is that constantly being bombarded by data and more and more numbers. And this is something that most regular humans don't want to do. They may want to do it for three months or so on, then move on with their lives. With that comes another aspect, that there is data, so we analyze data. And we analyze data to death, as if there is huge, uh, huge discrepancies or huge importance whether you walked 9,500 steps or 10,300 steps, which for any health reasons, there is no big difference. And with that comes something that designers, this is the domain of us designers, so far, interaction with these devices is very, very complicated. Many of these devices are limited with their UI affordances. Um, they use um, mobile phones as their main terminal, if you wish but they also have the web interface. And I have yet to find one device that does it really, really, really seamlessly. 
And there are these cases. Th th these are serious attempts to put something on your head, and these devices are actually quite important because they may take uh, brain scans and so on. So this is just kind of a quick overview of some of the problems we have. And with that, I could kind of conclude that the future is not going to look like that. Even though there are a few people roaming the Silicon Valley think that they'll, it will look like that, I could guarantee you that for 99.999% of the populace, it's not going to look like that. So let's talk about what works. What works and worked very well for Fitbit was the notion of flexible placement. People will pick their own best location, and with that, they'll also change it every once in a while. So there is no fixed location. People will just you know, change, and they'll pick their own personal best, but then they'll have a second best and third best. Um, simple cues, like a flower that was kind of the hallmark of the UI of uh, the first Fitbit, are essentially a glorified progress bar but they are somewhat more emotive. They give you some kind of um, smile, they give you a little bit of a sense of humor, and they inform you that you're more or less okay, and that's what you want to do with these devices. You don't want to count too many steps. Now, when we get to uh, data that requires some analysis, the Systems we have today are very good in giving you insights. They're not good in giving you foresights. What is going to happen? What needs to happen now and so on? Now, and as I mentioned earlier, the biggest problem we have now is that we are required to interact a lot. And as we do that, we lose interaction with, our, uh, with the people around us. So, what needs to happen? I think that we need to develop a new system that will have some kind of a personal area network that will have all the sensors and so on, and this will feed data to servers and eventually to doctors. And around that, we could cut a deal that part of this data should be anonymized and be used for research. And in return, maybe you could actually sell it in, again, anonymized form. This creates an economy around data that also serves the research uh, community. Today, this is not done yet. Uh, we can create better fit, and we could do that through 3D scanning. You could actually scan bodies, you scan your body. And the interesting thing now, if you're talking about the real cutting, bleeding edge of uh, uh, science today, is creating new organ from your own DNA placed on a 3D printed body part that was scanned from your body. So you could actually replace a knee or replace an organ by reusing your stem cells on a skeletal uh, structure that is 3D printing. And this brings me again to Project Ara that is now dealing with 3D printing not for fabrication but for manufacturing. We're, doing a, uh, we're, we're dealing with a machine that is about 50 times faster than any 3D printer now, uh, now in, in, in use. And one of the last things I want to say, that we need to move from the perception of smart devices to something I call wise devices, devices that know how to give you the right social cues at the right moment with the right tonality not ask themselves too many questions, and not give you too many advices. Something that is just right, very much like a companion, a good friend. And when it comes to what practically it means, I think it's a combination of haptic, uh, done correctly, uh, some level of other ambient UI, and a lot of very sophisticated filtering of data. That's about it. <laughs> so, so, so. We're doing questions. Okay. So, a couple of people out there with questions. We have one mic that has to reach you. So, put your fingers up if you want to ask something. We have one question over there. People with the mic. Gentlemen. 
you'll probably have to hand it over. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. Um, how do you see Moves, the app, compared to Fitbit? Is it dangerous to Fitbit? <laughs> Everything is dangerous for Fitbit because everybody is more or less after them. Um, there is a big fight now over uh, this activity section of wearables. Uh, I think Fitbit has uh, done a phenomenal job in building their brand. And I think they're more or less uh, inoculated, except for big events like Apple and so on. Uh, but the industry is moving on. So there are new advances, and it's now moving away from just motion and kind of uh, tracking steps to other fields, more invasive of the, you know, your biology. And each one of these steps is presenting opportunity and risks. Okay, next question, because we're going to have to move the mic. Hans, if you have a question. I could probably. I have that. one. Yeah. Uh, is that you, you come from industrial design. Yeah. You deal, we're talking a digital yep. day here. Yeah. Do you see differences in approaches to des designing wearables uh, between people who are educated as industrial designers or people who come from the di more digital field? I actually not familiar with people from digital fields who are doing wearables because the, the physicality of the object is so essential. But I'm familiar with people who came from fashion and so on and so forth. I think um, being an industrial designer by training, I actually today describe my, what I'm doing more as a technology design because we are working in this space where software and hardware could uh, be exchanged, so to speak. I'll give you an example. One of the first things we deal with is how big of a screen we need to have on a device. And it's actually a cardinal uh, decision because with more screen you need, uh, first, bigger size, but yeah. also you need more battery. And when you have a screen, you now need to present stuff in it, which requires you to have a faster processor, more communication, and so on. So the first thing we do, typically, is decide what is the optimal size of screen, which more or less sets the balance between the physicality and the digitality, if you wish, of the object. OK. okay. okay. Questions? Privacy. You're in the privacy. Front? So okay. I, I heard <clears throat> privacy, a huge topic. And I actually want to state that yesterday was a historical day in the US. The Supreme Court decided that all data in a cell phone is actually a private domain. And it's, it's, it will still be cascading uh, repercussions for that. Privacy is a big topic. I don't have a simple answer to that. I think uh, when we'll weigh as society the benefits versus the risks, and we need to have this discussion, and thanks to the ill actions of the NSA, we finally have this discussion, uh, we will get to a new balance. And for me, I would love it to be a balance that gives researchers enough data to do things that they cannot do in a lab. That's my take, but your take could be different. Okay, Gami, thank you very much. Okay. Big round of applause, please.